This week's guest, Kelly Bowen, author of The Paris Apartment, talks about the inspiration for her historical novels. Every one of my heroines and every single one of my books are all inspired by real people, by real women. I just simply borrow the best of their stories and craft a heroine. So my way of bringing that history to life. Welcome to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley, and my mother and co-host, Caroline Kilborn, is with us today. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mom, how are you today? <laughs> I'm good. It's another beautiful day, and uh, I'm just delighted to be here today and tell everybody about this wonderful book. Well, who do we have with us today? We have Kelly Bowen. And she is an award-winning author with a lifelong passion for telling stories about remarkable women doing remarkable things in history. Her ten novels and five novellas have been published worldwide and translated into five languages. She grew up in Manitoba, Canada, and attended the University of Manitoba, where she earned Bachelor, Bachelor of Science, Agriculture, and Master of Science, Veterinary Psychology, and Endocrinology. That's a mouthful. She worked as a research scientist before realizing her dream to become an author of historical fiction. And this book, The Paris Apartment, is historical fiction, but it's, it's I'm sure there's a lot of truth in it, too. I mean, it's just it's an amazing book. It really is. So we're, we're very happy to have her today. Welcome to Writer's Voices, Kelly. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So going from... A research scientist to a novel writer is kind of a big step. How exactly did that happen? Um, I actually, I've always loved writing, of course, writing and reading. Um, uh, when I had my first son and I was on maternity leave, I actually sat down and thought, I should try writing a novel. I love writing. Um, now seems to be a good time to do it. I can do it uh, at very odd hours, which is helpful when you're living with tiny little humans that keep odd hours <laughs> and so I wrote uh, I decided to write a novel I love history so I decided to write a historical fiction novel and it was uh, like it was awful <laughs> I finished it and it will never see the light of day again <laughs> was it was it World War Two like this one it was not it was actually set during the Second Crusade oh yeah period of period history that's always quite fascinated me <laughs> And I think it was about 140,000 words long. <laughs> it was awful. <laughs> so where did you go from there? Uh, so after that, I could at least, I think, objectively uh, kind of decide what, what I did and didn't like about it. Um, and then I wrote another one. Uh, and then I wrote another one. And then I wrote another one. So I wrote four. And I think at that point in time, by the time I'd written my fourth, I thought, Perhaps this isn't truly terrible. Uh, yeah, so I just kept writing. Um, I really, I loved the process. Um, it was an excuse to read history books. It was the best kind of homework. Uh, and I just loved the actual writing process. And it's like anything. You just need practice to get, hopefully, better at it. Well, when, what was your breakthrough? Uh, so uh, my fifth book, um, I had queried uh agents and I had entered uh, my last, the fourth book that I had written in some contests just for the purpose of getting some good feedback. Uh, like, you know, you can ask your mom or your friends to read it, but they're going to be polite and kind. And I needed someone to not be polite and kind. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, uh, my fourth book that was in a contest, it just so happened uh, the uh, person, the lovely person who is my agent now, um, she ended up reading it. Uh, the first 50 pages and said, this is fantastic. I like your voice. Can you send me the rest? So I'm just over the moon. I'm so excited. Yes, of course. And she read it and she said, yeah, I really, I really like your voice. Uh, I think you've got potential. Do you have anything that I could actually sell? <laughs> I said, um, no, what would that be exactly? So she had suggested um, at the time I was writing uh, more historical romance and she said, uh, if you could write something in the Regency, it's very popular, uh, publishers are looking for it, and if you could write me a novel and then a synopsis for two more in the series, she said that's a package that I could take and sell. Uh, so that's exactly what I did. I followed her advice, and she did exactly what she said. She sold that package, and that was that was the beginning for me. And was that uh, the Love by the Letters 
series? Or uh, no, no, that book, that very first book was actually uh, called I've Got My Duke to Keep Me Warm, okay. and it was the first of my Lords of Worth series. The Lords yep. of Worth series. Okay. So it looks like your books prior to the Paris apartment were all series. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, they're all, uh, my books prior to The Paris Apartment are all historical romances. The Paris Apartment is not. Uh, and yeah, and they're all series. Wow. So, I, is that a big, I, I mean, I know that the romance market has a lot of different genres. So, like, does each time period have its own, like, fans that just love to read that time period? Yeah, very much. <laughs> um, I find, I find romance readers in general, are very voracious readers of pretty much anything. Um, but yes, there's definitely readers that love the Regency or love the Scottish Highlands or love the Gilded Age set in New York. Um, not so different than uh, more uh, historical fiction, where you've got readers that love World War II set books or love books set uh, in a different time or place, that sort of thing. Right, right. So, do you have a favorite of the t different time periods you wrote about? Uh, I mm, that's that's a hard question. I don't know if I have a favorite. Um, I love being transported to different times and different places. Getting to write about them is just a bonus. Uh, no, I don't think I have a favorite. I have favorite things about each. I think is the best <laughs> I could do. So, one was the one you wrote about was the Regency. Where when were your other series set? Uh, they're all Regency. They're sets. all Regency. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that must be what you love is Regency. <laughs> and what time period a, was that exactly? So that's um, 1810 to 1821, kind of in there, uh, in, in England. Um, really an interesting period of time in terms of kind of economic, uh, social reform. Uh, you had the Napoleonic Wars in there. Just – and – uh, and then, of course, you had the Prince Regent, uh, who had taken over for his father, uh, and he was a bit of a party animal, loved all things kind of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It was a really fascinating time for what was going on and the things that were changing in there. Now, was, was Bridgerton set in that time period? Yes, Bridgerton <laughs> is also set in that time period. And it's one of the things that makes it so popular, because you have this kind of extravagance in the ballrooms and the parties, and, and it's... Uh, it, it's really interesting. And the Dukes. And the Dukes. Big the on Dukes. dukes. <laughs> Big on Dukes. If you read in if you read in the genre, you would think Dukes were like mice on every street corner, but they really weren't. <laughs> there wasn't that many of them during that period of time. I, I'm looking. But they're very popular in stories. <laughs> I'm looking at your website, and there's a one of your novella trios was No Dukes Allowed. Yeah, but. that was a little bit of a play. We kind of sat down and thought, <laughs> because lots of times you write a story and, and your editor might say, no, is there any way we can make him a duke? Because <laughs> dukes, dukes sell better. <laughs> and if we're in the process of, if we're all in the business of selling books, I'm I'm happy to, to well, upgrade my earl to a duke. <laughs> well, the sh Shakespeare had a lot of dukes too, you know? He had yeah. princes, but he had a lot of dukes. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> You're listening to Writer's yeah. Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Kelly Bowen, author of The Paris Apartment. So let's talk a little bit about that, because this is, like you said, it's not a romance, um, and it's not set in the Regency. So what what inspired you to write this book? So I've always had, since I started writing, I've always had um, a World War II book kind of lurking in the back of my mind. Um, it's a period of time that's super fascinating to me. Um, my grandfathers both served in the war, uh, and they uh, had huge collections of texts and uh, books um, that I remember going through as a kid. Um, I'm sure it was way over my head, but it just, the maps and that sort of thing just sort of fascinated me. So it's kind of always been lurking in my head. And the inspiration um, for the Paris apartment uh, kind of came about as a marriage of two kind of uh, news articles that I had read about uh, over the past years. And the first was um, the discovery of the girl at Horde, which was a Munich apartment that was filled with artwork that had been stolen by the Nazis. 
And the second was the discovery of an untouched Paris apartment um, that had been abandoned by uh, Madame de Florian before the Nazi occupation. And no one discovered that apartment until after her death, like 70 years later, it had just been completely abandoned. So both of those things kind of, it you know, kind of got the imagination going like, wow, like, how does that happen? What, what were the things that made those things happen? And then, of course, I always love, like you said, I always love writing about uh, just extraordinary women um, doing extraordinary things. And quite often, no matter what time period I'm writing in, um, the stories of the women in history are often hidden. You have to go digging for them. Uh, lots of stories about men uh, and their achievements, but the women uh, throughout history generally take kind of a back seat, even though their stories are no less extraordinary. Uh, so I love digging for those. So that's kind of all those three things together. That's kind of what was served as the, the base for the inspiration of the Paris apartment. I noticed on your website you have a page about women in history. And uh, yes. what, what does it take to qualify to get on that page? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what? Just women who did things uh, that they weren't supposed to do at the time, like the pioneers, the, the leaders, the – the ones who didn't listen to the people that saying you shouldn't, you you don't, you couldn't, you can't, and they just did anyways. It's kind of funny when I write um, books in the, uh, my heroines, even in my romance novels or in this book, people often say, oh, well, women never would have done that back then. And that's always puzzled me because the history books are just littered with the real stories of women who did that exact thing and then more. So that's always – it's always something that I just want to bring to the forefront to say women did do those things back then and they did more. <laughs> and I think if, um, you know, if we have any budding historical novelists out there taking a look at this list, you might find a, a subject to write about. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I, I use that list. Every, every one of my heroines in every single one of my books, uh, both my historical romances and my historical fiction, are all inspired by real people, by real women. I just simply borrow the best of their stories and craft a heroine who, who kind of – so my way of bringing that history to life. <laughs> I'm just fascinated by um, how much um, you had to delve into history and uh, so forth. Did you – were some of these things, some of these stories really, really true, or were they all just made up about these amazing women? Uh, in terms of my uh, the, historical the, fiction, like in the Paris apartment? In the Paris apartment, mm -hmm. specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're all based on real women, absolutely. So um, my character of Sophie, um, who ends up working for the special operations executive, uh, there, she, her story was based all on... Uh, real people. Um, I used Virginia Hall and Nancy Wake, uh, Pearl Witherington Cornioli. Uh, I used their stories and I read their memoirs front to back multiple times oh, uh, because to read a memoir, um, it's experiencing history through a person's eyes that was actually there. And yeah. so not only do you get the story of the history, you get the history itself, but you get what they felt, what they saw, what they smelled, what they were feeling. And that, that is the most, that's, that's, I love that. It is amazing to me what, I mean, I had no idea. I, I grew up during the Second World War. I had no idea that this was going on. But it was amazing that they could accomplish that. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, I just, because, uh, of course, mostly all you heard about, um, we used to go to, I used to go to movies with my with my folks, and there would always be a newsreel, uh, and it would always be about uh, what the Nazis were doing and so forth. And, and in the concentration camps, you never heard anything about resistance movements. And I just think, oh, gosh, they, that was amazing they could do all those things. It really was. Yeah, it, it was amazing. And what was, what was even more shocking, actually, when you think about it, it wasn't until 1942 that um, they started recruiting women for the special, like the SOE, to put in behind combat lines. It took that long because up until that time, the British government had said, uh, you know, life givers shouldn't be life takers. You, you can absolutely, women should not be part of combat at all, which is quite different from what was going on on the Eastern Front. Um, but on the Western Front, there was a very much a resistance to using women. Um, but by 1942, the British were literally running out of men. And yeah. um, at that point, like irregular male combatants, uh, spies, whatnot, sent behind 
enemy lines into occupied territories had a life expectancy of about three months because they became obvious targets for mm-hmm. for, for the Nazi occupiers. Because yeah. there weren't that many, you know, the, many of the Frenchmen, even if they could pass as a French person, they would have been expected to be fighting. Oh, absolutely. They were either fighting or they were shipped off to factories or, yeah, uh, healthy fighting age males in occupied France were an anomaly. Yeah. So it would be much easier for a woman to hide in plain sight. Absolutely. And they took full advantage of that. And so lots of these women, their job was to um, liaise with the uh, resistance, the, the French resistance that was on the ground in occupied France. So, Kelly, why don't you give us a little summary of the Paris apartment? <laughs> I always find this question the hardest to sum up your book in three sentences or less. <laughs> okay, you can give us a longer summary. <laughs> I'll, I'll try. I'll give you more than three sentences. Uh, okay, so uh, the Paris apartment uh, is a World War II set era book. Um, it, it takes place in occupied France in the past. Um, it has two narratives, a past and a present narrative. Uh, so the story starts in the present uh, with Leah, who's a young professional who has unexpectedly inherited a Parisian apartment from her grandmother after she passes away. And this is an apartment that nobody knew anything about. Um, and in the apartment, uh, Leah finds a virtual time capsule. Uh, she finds a huge art collection, uh, fine furnishings, expensive gowns. Uh, but most distressing to Leah when she goes into this apartment for the first time is the Nazi propaganda she finds. And she makes her to believe that her grandmother, that that with all the wealth, may have been uh, a Nazi collaborator. Uh, But with that, um, Leah's grandmother also left her a very small, obscure painting by an unknown artist uh, that she seemed to have valued above all others. And that painting is connected to a family of Gabriel Seymour, who's a renowned art restorer based in London. And Gabriel agrees to help Leah catalog and try to identify if any of the art is stolen. And as they go further into their investigations, what they find in the apartment walls uh, quite shocks them. So without giving away too many spoilers here, uh, the past narrative uh, reveals an extraordinary uh, unlikely partnership between two very different women who have taken two completely divergent approaches to the war. So uh, the character of Sophie Seymour, uh, who is my English spy, uh, she goes deep undercover uh, and then Estella Lord, who is Leah's grandmother, she endures her own crippling grief and ends up joining the resistance and uses her socialite upbringing to manipulate the Nazi officers who are occupying the Ritz Hotel in Paris. And what they accomplish and the legacy that they leave behind uh, is what Leah and Gabriel are left to discover in the, in the present. And this is, it's very exciting. Oh, well, thank <laughs> you very much. Glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's really... Um, grabs you and you know we've read a lot of World War II books and in fact there seems to be this spring um, quite a number of World War II books with women heroines uh, who are undercover or spies in some in some way I think I think actually yours is the third such book that we've done this spring Um, so I don't know if that means like this is just a really popular subject and that's really good Um, but it is, it is, it's very, it is intriguing. And I really, really enjoyed the detail and the, the suspense yes. in the Paris apartment. And I think having the, um, you know, the two narratives helped add to that suspense. Because you've got both sides, you're like really wanting them to find out you know, the modern day to find out, no, your grandmother wasn't a collaborator. <laughs> you know, you right. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and they do find that out pretty early on. So I don't, I'm not really giving a spoiler there, but, um, and, but there's some other mysteries that take longer for them to uncover. And, and then, you know, what's going to happen to these two women in, in, to, under Nazi occupation is just, and you you don't shy away from the from the stark realities of the time. I I tried not to. Um, it wasn't it, it wasn't 
Paris uh, was a little different in that when it was occupied, uh, it didn't suffer kind of what Warsaw, or Rotterdam, or Stalingrad suffered. Like it wasn't completely like raised to the ground. Um, it was occupied under this really bizarre veneer of like civility, and it was horrible because all the awful things that were happening everywhere else were still happening, but it was kind of just underneath it all, like under this, you know, with a officers would go and sit in their cafes and they would take over, you know, cinemas. And, and there was even, you know, brochures saying, you know, every, every Nazi soldier has to visit Paris at least once and come and visit all these wonderful sites. Meanwhile, underneath that all, the people that lived there were starving. The atrocities that were happening everywhere else were still happening. It, it, was, it was a really a bizarre juxtaposition. It was really strange. And that's kind of what I tried to include in this book. And, of course, there were collaborators. There were people who... Oh, absolutely. Sometimes because they agreed or sometimes just to survive. Absolutely. And, or sometimes oh, a combination. You know, I found it interesting how they trained these women. I mean, they, they showed them how to, how to smoke that, that, so that they would be believed to be Parisian, I mean, uh, from Paris and you know, all these in French, and, and then the ones that were fluent in German and French, they could, they pretended they didn't know German so that they could, <laughs> they could hear what all the guys were saying, and then, you know, they didn't realize that they were understanding them. That was, that was really cool, I thought. Yeah, that was one of the key things that the SOE recruited uh, for, was um, skill with languages, uh, and then familiarity with France, uh, if possible, Paris, or whatever, wherever they were going to be put um, for that exact reason, uh, if you walk into a cafe and order the wrong thing or you're smoking wrong or your mannerisms are wrong, I, you know, mm -hmm. the Nazis will pick up on that. They, they got very, very good at finding, finding people like that. Now, this Paris apartment uh, that inspired your story, um, I think we had another author about five, six years ago who also was inspired by that story, and there was a book called a Paris apartment instead of the yes, Paris apartment. Yes, I, I didn't actually realize that until after I had already started uh, writing my story. And um, I didn't read it until after I finished my story because <laughs> I didn't want, I, I didn't want, you know, her, her imagination or her ideas to, to somehow worm their way into my, into my book. Uh, so I wanted them quite separate. And then I read it afterwards and it was, it was really cool. It, <laughs> She took that inspiration, that same story, and told a different story. Oh, and absolutely. It was awesome. It was and, wonderful. And it was set during a different time period. It was the yep. Belle Epoque, or I'm not yep. sure how you pronounce that, but which is earlier. And yep. um, yeah, so that, I thought that was, I'm like, I started reading this. I'm like, I feel like I've read this before, but, but not. It's com different. <laughs> yeah, it was such a, it was such a, like really phenomenal story just that apartment that had literally been untouched for 70 years it was it was a museum it was a time capsule uh, how how did they do how is that possible i don't i well, kind of that's what i'm thinking in my head it. like doesn't a gas man have to go in there at some point or like the, i don't know an electrician to check on like at what point in time like how could nobody have been in or i yeah it was very strange and and yeah. i guess they own the apartments there that yeah, the family like had owned the apartment. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and I guess okay, you don't have utilities if their utilities are all turned off. But somebody has to pay the taxes on it. I'm guessing it was just kind of how I had mine set up. I thought <laughs> when I set up this book, I was like, how could she have had an apartment that no one knew anything about? And if there was a fund set up and the taxes were paid and everything was paid on time um, out of a pre pre existing pre-existing account no yeah. one would need to know yeah but then the question is why keep it such a secret why keep it such a secret <laughs> and why never yeah. go back especially with all the the wealth or the memories or whatever might be enclosed in that apartment and why dump it on your granddaughter after you die <laughs> right <laughs> Read the Paris apartment and you'll find out. <laughs> yes. Well, why don't, you, why don't you read a little bit from the Paris apartment for us? Sure. Uh, okay, so I'm going to read the passage that I picked to read here. Um, 
So Leah has uh, just gone into the apartment. Um, she's discovering this apartment. She's gone in for the first time. And I'm just going to – she's about halfway through the apartment, so I'm just going to pick up kind of where she – where she is halfway through her kind of exploration and discovery here and what she's thinking. We are here. All right. Though she had been told repeatedly by estate lawyers that this apartment was the domain of Estella Lard, Leah realized that she hadn't truly believed it until right now. She hadn't truly believed that her grandmother, who had not once in her life mentioned that she had ever traveled to Paris, much less here, had kept a secret of this magnitude for this long. And Leah couldn't even begin to imagine why she would have done so. She set the photo back down and examined the second. In this one, the beautiful Estelle was behind the wheel of a low-slung Mercedes, leaning out the window and laughing at the photographer. Her hair was loose over her shoulders, a jaunty hat cocked over one eye. Leah blinked, trying to reconcile these sultry, fearless images with the rigid, reserved woman she had known. She failed miserably. She turned her attention to the last of the photos and frowned. A German officer stared back at her, unsmiling and severe. From his uniform, it was clear that it was an image from the First World War. Leah frowned and turned it over, but there was nothing written on the back. She set the photo down and glanced at a pile of magazines stacked beside. She slid the top one off to the side. The issue beneath, devoid of dust, was easy to read. Signal blazed from the upper left corner in bold red text, the cover beneath dominated by an image of a Nazi soldier with an intense expression. A strip of the same bold red cover color ran down the spine of the magazine. September 1942, easily visible at the top. Leah snatched her hand away. This is not happening, she said into the silence, as if saying out loud would make it true. Because she already knew without opening the magazines what she'd find. German propaganda and glossy pro-Nazi photos, all published at a time when Nazis had overrun and occupied this very city. Leah stared again at a young Estelle laughing at her from her Mercedes and the nameless German officer before she turned away from the photos and the magazines and all their ominous implications. With a queasy dread settling into her gut, she made her way past the ornate, ornate mantel and around the corner. Here the space narrowed into a formal dining room. The center was dominated by a rosewood table surrounded by eight matching chairs. On the right, on her wall to the right, a cabinet taller than she was lined the space, rows of crystal, silver, and porcelain dinnerware displayed on the shelves. On the wall opposite the cabinet was another collection of paintings, striking and arresting portraits of men and women in clothing from different centuries. Leah bit her lip hard enough to hurt as dread intensified. Art had been a desirable souvenir for the Nazis during the occupation. Entire collection stolen. Stop it, Leah. She shook her head, not caring how foolish she sounded talking to no one again. Don't be absurd. Yes, there was Nazi propaganda in the apartment. But a single photo and a handful of magazines did not mean that the paintings on these walls had been stolen or otherwise illicitly obtained. It did not mean that her grandmother had deliberately kept this collection here in this apartment for any other reason than she had liked art when she had been younger. Conjuring conspiracy theories was best left to Hollywood. Leah tore her gaze from the paintings and continued through the dining room, stepping into a hallway. On her right, a doorway opened up into a kitchen with a tiny stove, a small refrigerator, and a deep sink set into a countertop free of clutter, save for a single crystal tumbler. Just to her left, a set of French doors stood open, the dim outline of a four-poster bed denoting this last space as a bedroom. As in the living room, lines of sunlight from tall windows were visible on the far wall. Leah entered the room, skirted the bed, and with a great deal more care than she had taken earlier, eased the heavy curtains open. In the light, the room was a decidedly feminine space, the walls papered in a shade of rose the edges near the ceiling only slightly yellowed and discolored. The room consisted of a double bed, a dressing table and a chair, and an enormous wardrobe all carved with a provincial flair. The bed was neatly made, and the linens, once washed, would likely be the same rose hue as the walls. The room was impeccably tidy, save for a garment, that had been tossed carelessly on top of the smooth colorlet, crumpled and forgotten and dulled by dust. It was an evening gown, Leah realized, moving to lift it by its thin straps. A stunning creation of le lemon yellow chiffon and crepe, beaded with crystals, and something that would be obscenely expensive no matter what century it had been purchased in. Not something one would toss aside like an old pair of socks. Bewildered, she let the dress drop back to the bed and eyed the narrow arched doorway in the corner beside the wardrobe. It led into what looked like a modern walk-in closet. A dressing room, Leah guessed, though there was almost no space to walk in. On both sides, dresses and gowns and furs and coats hung crammed together, 
spilling out on top of one another in such numbers that Leah couldn't even see the back wall. Shoes lined the floor, dozens and dozens of pairs, and along a shelf at the top, hat boxes were stacked. Smaller jewelry boxes, some of them covered in leather and satin, were piled in front. Good Lord, Leah mumbled, the excess hard to comprehend. She backed away and cautiously opened the wardrobe next, expecting to be inundated with another jumble of extravagance. But the wardrobe was almost empty, the cavernous interior yielding only a half dozen gowns. These gowns, protected from the years of dust, were a collection of couture silks and satins, each one exquisitely embroidered, appliqued, and detailed. Leah ran her fingers along the length of a sapphire-colored skirt before pulling her hand back, afraid that she would soil the fabric. She closed the wardrobe and rested her forehead against the double doors. The gowns, the shoes, the furs, there was a fortune in clothing here, just like there was a fortune in fine furnishings and a fortune in art, all of it hidden here for over 70 years. Leah had fallen down a rabbit hole, an overwhelming, insane rabbit hole that made a jump to abhorrent conclusions far too easy. She lifted her head and took a steadying breath. Assumptions never ended well. A career dedicated to science had taught her that. She would give her grandmother the benefit of the doubt. She would not believe the worst until such time as she was presented with irrefutable proof. For right now, she would put conjecture aside. Instead, she would make a list of things that needed to be done, tasks that required her attention immediately. Lists were made of numbers and needs, not speculations and suppositions. Lists were ordered and rational, and they had always helped her focus on what she could control when presented with disorder and uncertainty. Yes, a carefully curated collection of lists was exactly what she needed right now. <laughs> Feeling a little better, Leah headed back towards the bedroom doors, but stopped abruptly as she caught sight of her reflection. A little tarnished and spotted, the mirror mounted above the dressing table nonetheless revealed the trouble lines that still suffused her features. Almost involuntarily, she sunk onto the little chair, ignoring the dust, not taking her eyes off her reflection. Had her grandmother been the last to be reflected in this mirror? And if Leah could go back in time, what would she have seen? Who would she have seen? Her eyes dropped to the surface of the dressing table. A collection of decorative glass bottles huddled, huddled in the center. A pair of women's gloves lay discarded beside them, abandoned where they had been dropped. Beside the gloves, propped up against the bottom of the mirror, was a small card. A postcard of some sort, Leah thought, as she reached for it. It was a black-and-white photo of a long, looming building, a row of Roman columns lying in the entire facade like an ancient temple. An impressive display of architecture, marred only by the Nazi flag snapping proudly in the wind in the foreground. Dread returned and manifested into something far more sinister. Very slowly, Leah turned the postcard over. For the lovely Estelle, it read in scrawled favorite ink, with thanks, Herman Goring. Oh, boy. <laughs> and that was Kelly Bowen reading from the Paris apartment. So did you know a lot about art history before you started writing this? Uh, I, yes, uh, to some extent. Um, I, I love art. Um, I'm, I'm the classic tourist in whenever I travel to cities everywhere. I go to all the museums, uh, all the art, art museums. Uh, I certainly don't have any formal training in art or art history, uh, but I do love the topic and uh, have quite a collection of books books on them. <laughs> My favorite thing to research. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, so the research for that wasn't wasn't difficult for you. Oh, it was a joy. <laughs> <laughs> and did you you describe a number of, of paintings in the book, and are they based on real paintings, or are they just based on the artist? You know that you know a lot about that artist and are conjecturing other things they may have painted. So the Charles Le Brun painting um, that they find uh, uh, that that ends up so the Charles Le Brun that's in the, that's in the Ritz uh, that was actually found in the Coco Chanel uh, suite uh, not that just before they renovated the Ritz um, I'm going to say maybe 10 15 years ago when they did a renovation uh, they found that painting um, and no one really knew where it had come from. Uh, it was just hanging in this suite. It was kind of hidden in plain sight. Uh, so that was a real painting, and that's at the Met in New York right now. I've actually seen it. Uh, so I invented a past for it, and I borrowed that painting, and I hung it somewhere else at the beginning. <laughs> so that was a real painting that I used, um, and you'll find that in the Paris apartment uh, quite literally. And um, 
the the gas paintings um i made those up uh i just the ones that they find um that are connected uh to the family um story that kind of goes through the paris apartments i'm not going to give spoilers uh, i invented those three paintings but based on his previous work uh, based right. on on the paintings that he is famous for so when this um the paris apartment that you based this on the Madame, Madame, Mademoiselle de Florian? Yes. Or Madame de Florian. Um, do you know, did they like, were there paintings in there? There was a famous painting uh, that was found in that apartment. Um, oh, the name of the artist is escaping my memory at the moment, but it was, um, yeah, a painting of. Um, of a, of a woman, and it, the painting ended up being worth quite a lot of money. It was eventually auctioned. Uh, so, yeah, that kind of tidbit kind of thought, well, what if they had found an entire collection, which is kind of where the Girl at Horde inspiration came in. Um, that apartment certainly wasn't abandoned, um, but it had been kind of uh, an entire collection of art hidden since it had been stolen uh, in the 40s. Uh, the original um uh, Mr. Gurlitt was uh, an art collector, an art procurement, in art procurement for, for Hitler himself. And the paintings that he stole or bought or acquired by however, whatever means he used to acquire them, um, again, there was 1,500 paintings in a single apartment. Um, oh, now, wow. people, and so, play, you know, the Monuments Foundation, Monuments Men Foundation, uh, various uh, other people are working hard to find out where those paintings came from, who they rightfully belong to, and how can we return them to families. And in some cases, it's impossible because those families don't exist anymore. Mm. Wow. But that was, yeah, the, it was those were the two things that kind of inspired that. Okay. So it was Boldini was the painting. Yes. On, thank you very much. Paris, yes. I just Googled it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so... And and the the original owner of that apartment was a well known um, socialite during the Belle Epoque. How do you pronounce that word? Uh, I think it's Belle Epoque. <laughs> yep, Belle Epoque. Okay, yep. and um, you know, so so that's but there was but there's a World War II aspect to that story too, isn't there? Yeah, because she her, she yeah she yeah. fled she fled the Nazi occupation. Um, when France fell um, and, the, and the Germans marched in, um, there was a mass exodus out of Paris, out of all sorts of places. Lots of people fled south um, into the unoccupied zone or the Vichy, what would turn out to be the Vichy zone. And, uh, yeah, so it was – she was only one of millions that fled uh, in the face of the oncoming occupation. Well, according to Wikipedia, anyway, the original owner of the apartment was her was Solange um, Bolgeron's grandmother, Marte de Florian, and um, she was the socialite during the Belle Epoque. And then she died in the apartment in 1939, and her son lived there until um, 1966. And then it was inherited by Solange, who had fled. She's the one who fled to the south of France. Mm -hmm. And she never went back, but continued paying all the expenses until she died in 2010. So, so it was actually the, the woman who owned the apartment. It was her grandmother's apartment. So, so that's a little bit of a different, different story. Yeah, that's than, a cool story. Than yours, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't want to. I didn't want to feel. I wanted just the. I. You were just inspired by it. Yeah, inspired. Yeah, so yeah. I just took the. What would make someone abandon an apartment and never come back? Yeah. Yeah. And oh, yeah. why make those? Why, whoever abandoned that apartment and never came back? What, what happened? What sort of choices did they make to 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 end up there? So. Yeah, that's the best thing about history and then writing historical fiction is that you can be inspired by little parts of history and just borrow little pieces and parts and then tell your own story. Use it as a springboard. Now, Estella Lard was, who were the inspirations for that character? 
I, so I used um, uh, Andre de Jong. Um, she she was she was uh, a big part of the Freedom Line and um, kind of the resistance, and she helped uh, move pilots and downed airmen and soldiers um, through occupied zones and get them back uh, back back to England. Um, and countless uh, resistance um, fighters, uh, many of whom were women. Uh, so I used used them as a as a whole as an inspiration uh, for Estelle, uh, and then used her position as a socialite um, that would give her access to places like the Ritz Paris that were that were occupied. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering if you have used this technique of uh, two voices, you know, one in the past and, and one in the in the present before in your writings. Is this something you or have used that before? Yeah, no, this was the first time I had written dual narratives. Uh, so it it was definitely um, a challenge for me to learn how to do it well, like how to move a reader out of the past and present without being jarring, um, certainly without repetitive storytelling. As a reader, you already know things. Um, and I don't need to retell them in both the past and the present. Um, yeah, that sort of thing. So I, I hope I hope I did it did it all right. Um, I really enjoyed yeah. writing in both the past and the present. I, I really enjoyed that aspect of storytelling. But this was a first a first for me. My previous novels have all been told in one timeline. Well, to make it more complicated, you have two perspectives in the timeline in the past timeline also. Yes, I and I like I like having two perspectives. Um, I like doing it. I I use two different perspectives um, or more in in my previous novels. I just like being able to tell the story through different sets of eyes, which kind of gives a different viewpoint of something that's happening or how it's feeling or reasons why characters are choosing to do what they do. Uh, I, I really enjoy that. Yeah, and I think it works well, don't you, Mom? Oh gosh, yes, it, it certainly did. Oh, thank you. At first, at first, I was a little, you know, thought, oh gosh, this is going to be difficult, but it, it wasn't. It wasn't difficult to read. It wasn't difficult to connect them. I mean, you know, because once again, you're right. The reader is right there. You're experiencing what's happening. I, I enjoy, I enjoy it very much. So, Kelly, when you sit, when you started writing the Paris apartment, you had kind of an idea of of you know the story but did you know before you start writing do you have the characters sort of fully fleshed out in your mind yeah so um whenever i get asked am i a plotter or a pantser I, i'd have to say i'm <laughs> kind of kind of both but probably leaning more to a plotter um especially when it comes to like the framework of the story so before I start writing any book, and the Paris apartment, especially with the dual timelines. Um, so what I want to do before I start writing is define each of the characters, like who they are, and define what their internal arc or what their internal conflict is. Like what is it that they're struggling with that they are going to struggle with throughout the book and come out on the other side, like find, mm. find a conclusion to that struggle. Uh, so I wanted to find that internal arc of each of the characters very clearly before I start. And then I would like to define before I start the external arc. So what's the actual plot going to be? What What is the thing that throws these characters together and kind of guides them along on their story? The individual scenes in each or how they, how they interact, um, that can be more of a panther part. Sometimes uh, I have an idea of a scene. Uh, but then connecting scenes to scenes, it just kind of, I just kind of write it as it comes. But I have a very defined framework set out ahead of time, uh, so that I can always look, kind of look down the, look down the line and see where the tracks are headed. And how long do, is that planning process? How long does that take before you actually start writing? Uh, it depends on the book for the Paris apartment because I was starting uh, writing in a brand new period in a brand new setting um, with brand new characters. Uh, 
probably by the time I kind of outlined it, so I do my research, and as I'm researching, I'll take notes and write kind of write ideas for scenes and that sort of thing as I get inspired by things I read. But that process for sure is months and months. Um, it's not like a, I sit down for a couple of days and do that. That's kind of happens over, for this one, probably two to two to three months, perhaps. Uh, and then I have a pretty clear idea in my head what the plot's going to be. What, what are they trying to achieve? What they're trying to do? And then who these characters are. And then the writing can kind of start after that, once I have that clearly defined in my head. And do you um, take notes by hand, or are there are you doing it on a computer? What kind of tools do you use for this? So all my note taking um, I do by hand, old school. Uh, so I have <laughs> yeah, I have books and binders um, uh, where I take my notes, um, write ideas down, um, draw out timelines, um, like map out timelines, that sort of thing. Um, all my writing itself, when I actually sit down to write the book, I do it all on the computer. I don't do any by hand. But I like to have those notes always sitting kind of beside me. And I find that things stick with me if I'm doing research and I write something down. I find it sticks with me uh, much better when I hand write it out for whatever reason. I don't know. Um, but I do like to have those kind of visual aids kind of beside me as I write. Mm. So do you, do you um, like keep clippings and so forth all you have all that around you and yes absolutely um yeah. the things i find most most helpful are old photographs um if they're available um so for world war ii set books there's quite a lot of photographs um archive documents um the, when you said it was kind of when you mentioned that um you've read more books about women um uh undercover or behind mm -hmm. So in yeah. the last, say in the last decade, there has been more and more unclassified documents uh, come uh, ah. available. So documents that were kept classified for 70 years after the war, at, at some point in time, their kind of classification times out. And then they're archived for the public. So you can go in and get those documents and read them. Uh, and I suspect a lot of that has probably opened up, shed a lot of light on what actually went on in the women, and the role of women in, in, in during the war that up until now has been kept completely out of sight. So, uh, oh, interesting. Those, yeah, so a lot of those documents, um, they're online, and if they're not online, um, I, I have no trouble reaching out to historians, uh, people that are way more knowledgeable about me about history if I run into uh, something that I can't find or I don't know, or I've kind of ran into a wall. And uh, they've been so, in my experience, they've been so generous and helpful. And, yeah, they'll just uh, direct you, oh, you want to read these documents? Here, I'll give you the link, and you can just log on. And those documents, the classified documents, are there. You can read them. So when it came to um, the cipher equipment that's included in the Paris apartment, um, I was actually able to read the classified, previously classified documents. Uh, when they captured uh, Lorenz' machine uh, in 1945. So it, it was, that was part of so cool. And where are those actually online? How do you find them? Uh, depending where you're looking, um, these uh, different, um, there's like the TICOM archives, um, the um, National Archives has an online database. There's quite a few online databases that uh, you can search um, the amount of, of online data that's out there is quite staggering. It is amazing, isn't it? It really is. <laughs> now, how about, you know, going to Paris for research? Did you do that? So I, I couldn't, uh, well, I, I didn't go, I've been to Paris, um, and because I'm such a history buff, I did go to Paris and took myself on a historical tour of Paris. <laughs> um, but this was probably, I'm going to say, 10 years, probably a decade ago. Uh, so when I was writing The Paris Apartment, um, we had this little pandemic thing happen. <laughs> so any uh, <laughs> any travel yeah. to Paris was, uh, wasn't possible during that point in time. Um, but uh, my previous travels through Paris, uh, I had taken tons of photographs, uh, collected tons of maps and books and stuff like that on my travels. Uh, and I referred to those quite often 
uh, again, because World War II has always fascinated me. So when I traveled there, I visited many of the World War II sites and the history in the in the city about that. So I had kind of a reference book of my own to go back to. Now, I understand that along with World War II having always been interesting to you or something that you, you know, were wanted to learn more about, there was specifically radio usage in World War II was an interest of yours. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, kind of the guts of the Paris apartment, the, the it's kind of a roundabout answer, I know, but <laughs> the end of the the end of the book um is kind of like why do people cho- make the choices that they make and why do they um hide things or not discuss things so my grandfather um who served uh in the RCEME uh and served overseas uh when he came back from the war from World War 2 um he didn't speak of the war at all like it was we just didn't no one talked about it ever like, certainly he didn't talk about it to his kids. He certainly didn't talk about it to his grandkids, to myself. Yeah, um, that being said, uh, by, from the, by the time I was 10, um, I could read radio schematics, and I can identify and solder correct capacitors and resistors and transistors. Um, he would test me on them, and I would pick them out of the little, the little, his little bins. Um, I'd spent hours and hours in the basement with him putting radios back together. That was kind of, kind of his thing, and became our thing. And so we rebuilt um, a giant 38 RCA Victor, one of those giant, huge radios. I still have it, and then a really pretty little 42 um, Northern Electric, Electric that he had picked out of somebody's trash bin, and we put it back together. And he ended up giving it to me for my 13th birthday. So he kind of shared his his war experiences with me in a very in a very different way. And at the time, I didn't recognize it. I recognize it now. But um, it wasn't a topic that was ever discussed. Uh, my great uncle, uh, who served in World War I, um, I have his diaries and his letters. He was killed in action in 1918. But he held nothing back. Reading his diaries, he just wrote it all down for anyone to read or, or in his letters for anyone to understand what he was experiencing. And when I wrote The Paris Apartment, that contrast kind of, stuck with me. So in one hand, I have a relative who did not did not waste words, and another who spoke not at all about his experiences. So that was the kind of contrast um, that stuck with me when I sat down to write The Paris Apartment. And so the radio, um, the spies that were behind the lines used radios to communicate um, to England? Yes. But the and the Germans were also using it, and there was a lot of um, a lot of encoding and decrypting and secret messages and yes. So the know. yeah. So what so what um, the character of Sophie ultimately gets sent to sent to Paris for is to determine if there's a Lorraine cipher um, that they she can capture or uh, diagram or find any information on, and so. Um, we've all heard, most people probably heard of the Enigma machine, which is pretty, which is pretty popular, and there's been movies made about it. Um, the Lorenz, uh, was the Enigma machine on steroids. It was just even a more complex Enigma machine, which made, of course, the breaking, uh, code breaking even more difficult. And, um, high, German high command used that, and it was almost undecipherable until eventually, uh, the Allies cracked it. So there's no evidence in fact, that they actually had a spy that went in and was able to find a Lorenz machine and it was able to oh. photograph it or anything. There is no, there is no, I haven't found any Darn. information that that actually happened. Um, most of what I've been able to read, the books I've been able to read, that the actual decryption of that machine was all reverse engineering, which is absolutely phenomenal. It's absolutely staggering to think that they reverse engineered something that they didn't even know what it looked like or what it, how it was put together. Um, but I chose to perhaps, um, you know, maybe add a page to the history books just for my <laughs> own, <laughs> for my own, um, for my own story and historical fiction. 
<laughs> now, Kelly, you've written that you tend to inherit all of the uh, old things found in relatives' basements and attics, and I think, Mom, you would identify with that um, because my grandmother kind of gathered all the old things from her, both sides of the family, both hers and my grandfather's, and passed them on to Mom. So, um, but what what do you do with all of them? <laughs> um, the, the, yeah, the documents I keep, um, all the documents I keep, um, I've digitalized um, as much of them as I can. They'll be, so they're available to anyone else in my family that, it might decide they are interested in it. Um, there's not a lot. Most of it, most of it is documents or um, written letters, that sort of stuff. So it's not like it takes up a lot of space. Um, a few things. Uh, my uncle's letters in his war diary. I also have his field binoculars and his razor blades. So just a few things. I I keep oh, them. Wow. I've just kept them right now. Um, perhaps someone will become interested in them one day. Uh, and I can pass them along, but for right now, they just um, they sit here, and well, they're kind of neat. Kelly, you you would you would uh, we should get together sometime because among the things that we have are letters from um, the brother of one of Mom's forebears who from in the Civil War, and they he was on a hospital ship, for example, in the Bay of Vicksburg when the Battle of Vicksburg was going on. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would go in and you wouldn't see me for days. <laughs> I love reading letters. It's the same thing as memoirs, right? Because you get you get yeah. more than history. You get the human element yeah. to the history. Absolutely. Yeah. There's one where he's writing about being in Missouri because uh, he was from Iowa and he was um, in Missouri. And as they were marching, you know, through Missouri, they would um, tell the slaves that they met along the road to fall in to fall in you know with them and they, he wrote that some of them would but others would say oh if 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 massa catches me i'll be dead you know and so but some of them would come with them but when they got back to their camp they weren't allowed to they weren't allowed to bring them in they weren't allowed to bring them into the union um, territory and so he took up a collection um, among the other soldiers and gave them money and directions how to get north Fascinating story. Yeah. That's and then, of amazing. course, there's one about uh, Melinda, who is who had a, um, a station on the Underground station Railroad. Station on the Underground yeah. Railroad. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, my, yeah, my, my so you're inspiring me with your with the with your uh, family history inspiration, Kelly. I, I yeah, I I love <laughs> those the letters and the little stories that you find like that. They're they're so inspiring. Oh, absolutely. Well, we're out of time, and so we're going to have to say goodbye. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank, thank you, you so much for being yeah, here. Yeah. And, Mom, do you do you have some closing words? Yeah, I do. That You know, uh, the people that were involved in this in the underground, and uh, they were working for a, a cause that was magnanimous. And anyway, the, the death of hope is a truly awful thing. And so but those that could keep that hope always were real heroes. Well, thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Mom. See you all next week on Writer's Voices.